Ain, a member of the kingdom's strongest fighting force, the Phantom Knights, descends into a dark and derelict church. A hoarse voice croaks out, annoyed that someone would dare interrupt his precious research. Ain identifies him as Gunnam, the King of the Dead. Gunnam is impressed that Ain knows who he is and, yet, would still dare stand in front of him. He asks how he was able to bypass his traps, but Ain wouldn't really describe those obstacles he ran into as traps. Gunnam half warns and half brags to Ain that he is powerful enough to defeat even veteran knights who possess golden dragon medals. Gunnam looks down on Ain, who appears to be a run-of-the-mill, underpaid knight. He taunts Ain and says he'd be better off finding three golden dragon knights before trying to fight him. Without a word, Ain thrusts his sword towards Gunnam's eye, which he quickly avoids by momentarily dissipating his body. Gunnam may have underestimated Ain, but it still isn't anything he should be worried about. He opens a portal to the land of the dead and summons a creature to fight by his side, a powerful undead dragon. Gunnam orders his monster to attack Ain's life points directly, but Ain calmly takes up a steady stance with his legs spread wide. Gunnam is confused by what Ain is trying to do at first, but then he sees an unearthly and almost supernatural aura about him. With but one strike, Ain cuts down the dragon and reminds it of what it already was, dead. Gunnam's own body is sliced in two, and even he doesn't quite understand what just happened. It all happened so fast, at a speed that his eyes were incapable of following. Gunnam asks him for his name, and Ain complies, though his name is simply an alias. Gunnam knows his name well, and it's nothing good. It is the name of the nameless number one knight of the kingdom, one of the four knights created by the dark side of the church. Gunnam chuckles to himself. He never knew that the phantom knights existed, which tells him that the kingdom really is going down. He tells Ain that he'll never receive the glory or accolades, even if he devotes his all to the kingdom. He foretells that Ain's very existence will end with a whimper, and without happiness as a living human being. Ain finally shuts him up. Ain stumbles out of Gunnam's hideout, musing over what his short-lived adversary said. Ironically, the things Gunnam talked about never came to mind. He had been taught that emotions and glory were unnecessary to the mission. The only thing that matters is that the job was done. For the first time, Ain wonders if he feels fulfilled doing his work. Is he really failing to live as a human? Emotions that were bottled up under layers of indoctrination rise to the surface. For the first time, he feels fear. Fear that he's wasting his life away. With this sudden self-awareness, Ain asks himself, what should he do now? Ain returns to the holy city of Sain within the Adia kingdom. He hands Cardinal Nesha his report on the recently concluded mission. Nesha, a stone-faced man, dispels his disguise and returns to her original form upon seeing who it is. Ain tries to talk about a mass of people that were suddenly spirited away toward the north, but she's far more interested in learning about his encounter with Gunnam. There is nothing that Nesha does not know. Nesha is an alchemist and an extraordinarily powerful witch. She has over 20 aliases, using her various positions of power to leverage her own interests. She is the true ruler of Adia, and she pulls its strings from the shadows. She was also responsible for plucking Ain and four other orphans to form the Phantom Knights, using profane, taboo magic. Ain doesn't feel particularly strong about it since he's always accepted it as natural, but today Nesha notices that he looks lost. He tries to tell her about what Gunnam told him, but he ultimately decides not to disclose his true feelings. Nesha, like a worried mother, reassures Ain that she is here to help, and she encourages him to tell her what's weighing down his mind. Ain kneels and tells Nesha that he wants to enroll at the local academy. Nesha, predictably, is confused by his request. He explains that Gunn laughed at him for having an empty life, and during his return journey to Sane, something caught his eye. An academy filled with people his own age, laughing, playing, and gossiping. He felt envious. This was his first time feeling such an emotion, and he feels that if he enrolled at such a school, it might give his empty life some meaning. Nesha understands what Ain is trying to do, not that she approves of it. She's almost in shock that one of her fan mites would say such meaningless things. Ain immediately regrets bringing the subject up. However, to his surprise, Nesha actually agrees to his selfish requests. She tells him that in three years' time, he will no longer be Ain, a phantom knight, but a nameless orphan enrolled in the Knight Academy. The Academy headmaster is a close acquaintance of Nesha's, so admission into the school will be an easy matter. However, she warns him that his existence is still a secret from the world, so she asks him not to stand out too much. Ain feels relief and even gratitude that his wish has been granted. Nesha, predicting that it would be troublesome if he were to be put into the upper class group, decides to assign him to the lowest class regardless of his entrance results. Ain is grateful for Nesha's help, 
and like a loving mother, Nesha hopes that he finds what he's looking for. She encourages him to do his best, and Ain, riding on cloud nine, happily exits the church with his wish fulfilled. Nesha smiles as she watches her foster son walk away. How lovely. How amusing. Her beast of billows, trying to be a human. She looks forward to the interesting and delicious developments that will unfold by letting him loose in the world. A few days later, the Royal Academy conducts its entrance examination day. As usual, the rich people are doing rich people things by bullying poor people. A small child tries to gain entrance to the academy, but a snotty noble stands in her way. When the girl refuses to leave, the noble asks his bodyguard to break her arms off. His bodyguard grabs her arm and prepares to carry out his order, but Ain steps in at just the right moment. He tries to descalate the situation and calm everyone down, but the noble, a man named Kand, talks down to Ain for trying to speak back to him. Ain raises an eyebrow. He's never heard of the name Kand, but it's a stupid name, and he should probably just leave the girl alone. Kand sighs and assumes that Ain is yet another clueless commoner. He has his bodyguard pick on him too, but the young girl, not wanting to involve Ain in her mess, begs them to let him go. She even offers to go home to her village. Her peace offering backfires, and Kand is angrier than ever, and he slams the young girl for talking back to him. He lets her know that his family, the Camercines, are a distinguished clan of knights, going back generations. He feels insulted, no, disgusted, that the likes of Ain would want to join the world of knights. Ain thought that even commoners could join the academy without having a pedigree, but Kan tells him that this is all on the surface, to appeal to the common man. He explains that lineage is everything for a knight. Magic and martial prowess are intrinsically linked to one's bloodline, so a self-taught swordsman like Ain could never hope to match a purebred like him, especially not at Le Dante Royal Academy, a prestigious institution that only produces first-rate knights. In case he hasn't made his point, Kan tells Ain that he doesn't belong here. While Ain understands his decision is a stupid decision, and he decides to ignore it, the academy still has an exam, and he prefers to let that judge his abilities. Kan loses his patience. If Ain can't get it through his thick skull that he doesn't belong here, then he'll have to show him with force. Kan charges his body with a mana circulation spell, augmenting his physical abilities. Ain asks him if he's sure about this, as he'd hate for him to be injured right before the exam. Kan laughs at this very funny joke. He's going to enjoy wiping Ain's grin off his face. Kan's mana flow changes and Ain can tell that he's about to use the light step technique, a near instantaneous movement skill. Kan springs himself towards Ain faster than the normal human eye can see, but Ain has already anticipated his movements. He moves five steps back, and Kan flies right past him. Kan stands there with a smug look on his face, fully expecting to see Ain on the ground, writhing in pain. Ain is currently a few feet behind him, without a scratch on his head. Ain taps him on the shoulder to show where he is. While Ken tries to wrap his head around how this little switcheroo happened, Ain observes that Kan can't actually keep up with the speed of his own movement, which is why he didn't realize that Ain moved too. Kand, embarrassed, does the logical thing and draws his sword. He won't be made the fool, and he certainly won't be made the fool by a commoner of all people. Ain looks at him with a pitying face, and he apologizes for embarrassing him like that. Kan's reached his boiling point. No amount of apologies will save Ain now. Ain tells Kan that it's dangerous to use a sword, while avoiding being hit with the aforementioned sword. Kand, exhausted, acknowledges that Ain is quite skilled but warns him that due to the quality of his mana, Ain will be the loser in the long run. Ain tilts his head and absolutely destroys Kand by telling him that he hasn't been using mana circulation at all. Kand is hit by a bucket of ice cold water and a piping hot serving of reality. He refuses to believe him, and he decides to go all out. Kand slams on the gas, pumping up his speed to near superhuman levels. Unfortunately for him, Ain was the one who set the bar. As Kan executes his Barry Allen maneuver, he tells Ain that this is the trump card of the Camercine House, a secret technique that only those who have mastered their light step technique can use. This is the flash of the nine circles, and he dares Ain to escape it if he can. Ain escapes it by kicking Kan so hard in the face that the author had to dedicate a two-page spread to it. Kan lands roughly a few feet away, bloodied, bruised, and near unconscious. Ain commends Kan for the move he was about to execute, but remarks that his foundations for the light step are still far too poor. Noticing that a crowd is starting to gather, he decides that it's the best time for him to leave. He calls out to the girl from earlier and suggests that they make themselves scarce. She thanks him for helping her out of that situation, but she's still concerned about whether Kan is still alive. Ain reassures her that all he did was lightly kick Kan, 
The fact that he's still in one piece is enough. Kan recovers enough strength to threaten to ruin Ain's life. Ain was right. He's still alive. The young girl thanks Ain again, and she introduces herself as Lulu. After exchanging names, Lulu remarks that she is rather disappointed to learn that horrible people like Kand are attending this school. When Lulu finds out that Ain is a commoner, she asks him to be her friend if they both happen to pass the exam. Lulu, realizing that she may have acted a little too forward, tries to take back what she just said. She explains that she's been nervous the whole time, since the school seems to be filled with nothing but nobles. Meeting Ain and knowing that he's a commoner just like her is a great comfort. Ain is admittedly excited to be making friends. He has yet to actually enter the school, but he feels that he can clear his main objective within three years. Ain starts to cry, explaining that he's never met someone he could call a friend before. When one of the academy examiners announces that the exam will begin shortly, Ain and Lulu bid each other farewell until they meet again. Meanwhile, Han swears to exact his revenge on them both. Ain senses Can planning something unsavory, but he decides that he won't hold back the next time he tries something. Ain has lived an empty life before, and he won't let it happen again. For the first time at this very academy, Ain will live out his best life, provided he passes the entrance exam. Ain and Lulu enter the exam hall, which is filled with over 500 people. Ain has a roughly 60% chance to pass the exam, though he feels conflicted over having to be out other people to do just that. He resolves to at least get a passing grade. Lulu trusts that Ain will pass the exam with flying colors, though she isn't as confident in her own prospects. Ain takes being a friend way too seriously, and he starts crying on her behalf. Lulu frantically tries to get him to calm down, and she promises to do her best. Soon, the proctor begins the first part of the exam, a written test. The bell rings, and it's off to the races. Ain glances at his exam paper, which covers a variety of topics ranging from spell theory, alchemy, history, night training, and military strategy. Though the coverage is wide, Ain is confident that he's prepared enough for it. He's already memorized all the books he procured from Nesha. Ain answers the test with confidence in his stock knowledge, including a rather tricky question involving ancient dragons. After the exam, he reunites with Lulu, who is also quite confident in her chances. She asks Ain how he did, and he replies that he did his best with the little time he had to prepare, though he admits he got a little stuck with the dragon question. Lulu wants to hit pause for a second there. He's seen a dragon before. The second phase of the exam begins, magic demonstration. They are to fire off three spells of their choice to hit golems eight meters away. Everything about their spells, from strength to speed to mon output, will be judged. Lulu lightly slaps her face to psyche herself up, which Ain copies. He's never seen anyone do that before. Lulu often second guesses herself when it comes to academics and swordsmanship, but if there's one thing she's proud of, it's her magic. She is capable of wielding two distinct elements, which in this case are fire and water. It is partially the reason why she was accepted into the academy. She explains that there are eight cardinal elements, not counting the null attribute. Being able to dual wield elements is rare, even among the nobility. If this is true, then Ain realizes that the enemies he's been fighting are actually quite skilled. One of his peers within the Shadow Knights also has the ability to use all eight attributes of magic. Even with this precedence in mind, he considers Lulu to be surprisingly adept. He admits that he only has one element, and even then, he isn't able to utilize it to its fullest. Lulu is surprised that even Ain has a weakness or two. Ain's body was carefully modified by Nesha, allowing him a drastically increased rate of mana output. While useful for general purpose mana circulation, it prevents him from doing anything that requires delicate mana control since there's simply too much mana that spills out. Ain hopes that he can do at least enough to pass. A noble struggles to hit a golem with his third shot, causing one of the examiners to lament the poor quality of nobles as of late. However, when he sees Lulu, a commoner on his list, his interest is piqued. The examiner, Thomas, asks her to step forward, he tells her that he was given instructions to be a little harsher when grading commoners, so this is nothing personal, just business. Thomas summons the golems a bit farther away than normal, which he says is a test of her resolve to enter a world that only the nobility are welcome in. Ain notices how nervous Lulu is, but she works up the courage to step forward. She'll show everyone what she can do. She takes her stance in front of the range, and Thomas gives her the signal to start. Lulu casts a level 2 spell, Fire Spear, that flies true and hits its target. Thomas is impressed, and he tells her to move on to the next one. For her next spell, Lulu casts a level two water gun, which also finds its mark. This leaves quite an impression on Thomas, 
who notices that she has exceptional control for a dual element spellcaster. Lulu breathes a steady sigh of relief now that this portion of the exam is over. Ain commends her on a jot well done, and he reassures her that she's a shoo in to pass the exam. Lulu thanks him for his support, but now it's her time to return the favor. She hands him a charm that her grandmother made for her, and she lends it to him too. She believes in him wholeheartedly, even though they met just an hour and a half ago. Ain can't bottle up his emotions. It's his first time receiving a gift. Ain steps up to bat, and he prepares the one element he can use, darkness. He prepares a rank two dark ball, which Thomas takes note of. It's a very rare element. Ain fires his dark ball, but the shot goes wide and destroys everything that isn't a golem. The impact of the spell kicks up a mountain of dust and debris, but all Ain can think of is that he missed. Ain tries to delicately strike a balance between passing the exam and not attracting attention to himself. Thomas, on the other hand, is frazzled by the sudden power brought to the table. Ain does the exact opposite of what he planned. He attracts attention to himself by casting a rank 5 spell, Abyss Break. If he can't hit the target accurately, all he has to do is hit everything. Thomas tries to stop him from unleashing the spell, but it's too late. A destructive force strikes the field, causing considerable damage to the academy. If Thomas weren't there to mitigate the blast, the nearest building would have collapsed. Thomas tries to get a grip on the situation, while Ain realizes that he missed yet again. Undeterred, he decides to cast an even more powerful spell, but thankfully Thomas gets to him in time. Ain, still thinking that he's failing the test, asks for one more chance to hit the golems. Thomas, who just wants to get this over with, gives him a perfect score, and he asks someone to contact the Earth Department so they can repair the field. Ain, thinking that he's being given preferential treatment, tries to fire another one of his spells. Thomas has to physically restrain him. While the Earth Magic Department is hard at work repairing the field, Ain sulks over not being able to hit his target. Lulu tries to cheer him up and reminds him that their next exam is the swordsmanship portion. This time, they have the same examiner, Sir Cars. Ain notices Lulu's eyes glistening with admiration for Sir Cars. Lulu is confident that she can read people well, and by looking into Cars' eyes, she can tell that he is a person filled with kindness. Ain seriously wonders about that. Can staggers into the room, calling out to his big brother. When Cars sees the state Can is in, Can claims that a commoner sucker punched him. Cars comforts his brother while his hatred for commoners festers. When Can sees Ain and Lulu, he points at them and claims they were the ones who injured him. All hints of kindness disappear from Cars' eyes. Cars introduces himself as one of the kingdom's royal knights, here to assist the academy with their entrance exam. He looms over Ain and Lulu, intent on returning the favor for the injustice they dealt his brother. Cars has always been against allowing commoners like Ain to enter the academy, so he's going to make sure that this exam is the most ridiculous, difficult, and torturous endeavor he's ever experienced. Can wastes no time laughing at Ain, even though, as a noble, he's already guaranteed a perfect score on the swordsmanship exam. I love nepotism. Cars summons his trust blade to his side, and he decides that Lulu will be the first to suffer his wrath. Lulu's knees tremble, but Ain is her support. He volunteers to go first on her behalf, and Cars has no complaints. He was going to beat them both, regardless. Cars explains that the exam is a simple exchange of blows, though he remarks that accidents during the exam aren't unheard of. He tells Ain not to hold anything back, unless he wants to lead the academy on a stretcher. Cars coats himself in mana and instructs Ain to do the same, but Ain will only do so if he thinks he needs it. Without a shred of hesitation, Cars attacks. Their swords clash in the center of the room, where Cars taunts Ain, saying that he should have left when he had the chance. It's too late for apologies now, and he'll slowly take his time toying with him. Cars starts slowly increasing his strength, and upon noticing that Ain hasn't budged an inch, he commends him. Cars starts trying for real, and he expends enough force to make the ground beneath them split open. Lulu fears for Ain's safety, but actually, Ain is quite comfortable. Cars can't believe what he's seeing. Ain hasn't moved, and to make matters worse, Ain is still acting like a cheeky Brit. This is the final straw for Cars. He was only intending on taking an arm away from Ain, but with his latest Spider-Man quip, he's going to take everything from him. Cars decides to use the highest level of his physical enhancement spell to grind Ain's bones to dust. Despite all his bravado and C-list villain speech, Ain hasn't moved at all. Cars tries to rationalize how this could be possible, but Ain remarks that he thought Cars was going to be serious. Something inside Cars just snaps. He disengages from Ain and uses the distance between them to thrust his sword forward. Ain deflects it without effort. Cars is shocked beyond belief. 
Kand and Lulu are unaware of the reality of the situation, and they believe that Aang is screwed. Suddenly, Thomas runs into the exam room to try and stop Cars from going all out against an exam candidate. Cars doesn't hear him, and he goes all out against an exam candidate. To Thomas' shock, Aang isn't just surviving the onslaught, he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an active knight of the kingdom. Cars desperately tries to find anything that will give him the edge, because if he loses, it'll be his funeral. The only thing worse than death is being embarrassed in front of everyone like this. Ain notices a crowd forming behind him. He tells Cars that his mana circulation is too simple and his technique is crude. He's already seen through his technique, since Kan was kind enough to give him a little demonstration. Cars brings his sword up and slashes downward, but Ain nudges it with the pommel of his own sword, causing Cars to hit himself in the jaw. In a heavyweight match, that'd be a knockout, and it is. Ain handily defeats Cars, but when he realizes that he may have taken it a bit too far, he decides to take the most logical course of action and pretend he didn't know what he was doing. Thomas inspects Cars' body and asks what Ain did, but Ain claims that he was just frantically evading his attacks. Regardless of what happened, the fact remains that Cars is down for the count, and they're down an examiner. Kand angrily strikes his brother to try and get him to wake up, since he was counting on him to help him cheat his way through the exam. Thomas, overhearing everything, suggests that Kan keep that to himself, unless he wants to get apprehended for cheating. Kan can do little, but grit his teeth. Thomas turns to Ain, who still insists on redoing his exam with another examiner. However, Thomas sees no need to do that. He's already seen what Ain is capable of. He's not stupid. Thomas instructs the other examinees to wait for a replacement examiner, and he carries the groggy cars out of the room. Lulu approaches Ain and thanks him for going first, though he still thinks he failed somehow, even though he literally just beat the examiner. Lulu tells Ain that he's selling himself too short. He fought bravely against someone scary to protect her, just like a real knight would, and she's pretty amazing. Even if they somehow fail Ain, Lulu will fight tooth and nail to protest it, provided she passes her own exam first. A few days later, the exam results are announced. Ain reunites with Lulu at the assembly area, though the feeling is bittersweet. This may be the last time they see each other. Nearby, Kand is praying to God Almighty that he gets into one of the upper classes, because if he doesn't, his father just might kill him. Ain asks Lulu what the upper class is, and she explains that the academy uses the exam result rankings to determine what class a student receives. There are five classes to accommodate 180 students per year level. A is at the highest, and E is at the lowest. Furthermore, your class will influence your future career. Thus, the upper classes are usually made up of high-ranking nobles, while the lower classes are often made up of low-class nobles. A golden owl flies onto the perch and announces that the results will be revealed soon. It is profane and hurls more insults than a call of duty lobby. The owl removes a sheet from a massive bulletin board, revealing everyone's results. By some miracle, Lulu managed to inch her way into class E to Lulu's surprise. Ain is her classmate, with his score being the very bottom of the barrel. Ain isn't surprised, considering that he pretty much messed up nearly every exam he took. However, he isn't bothered by it. To him, the more important thing is that he was able to get into a class with his friend. Meanwhile, Kand is furious to learn that he has been placed in D-class, and he questions the integrity of the academy itself. Lulu is just glad she isn't in the same class as him. However, the most surprised of the bunch is Thomas. He knows that Ain deserves more than class E, making him wonder just what the principal is planning. Thomas storms into Principal Furzen's office, voicing his disapproval of his methods of currying favor with the nobles. Furzen scowls at Thomas and explains that trying to make the nobles enemies would only harm the academy's reputation, but that isn't all. Thomas brings up Ain, whom he awarded perfect scores on the second and third exams. For some reason, he was given the bottom most ranking. Furzen recalls telling Thomas to intentionally lower the scores he gives commoners, but Thomas reasons that Aim was able to easily use rank 5 magic and defeat a royal knight. It would be a huge loss for the kingdom if such a talent were to waste away in classy Furzen, seeing how fervently Thomas is fighting for Thomas's sake, decides to tell him the truth. Furzen explains that he will be instructing Class E this year. The reason Aim was ranked last is because the Forbidden Witch asked them to. Furzen describes the witch as a monster who controls the royal family and church from the shadows. He explains that he received a letter from this witch, asking him to watch over her beloved child. Furzen warns Thomas not to do or say anything that might offend the witch, because if they do, they may not be easily forgiven. Already, Nesh's crow familiars circle the academy, keeping a close eye on them. While Thomas tries to process this new information, Ain arrives at the door. 
Ferzin changes his attitude completely, and he treats Ayn like he's a guest at Caesar's palace. Ferzin tells Ayn that he's heard about all the details about him from Nesh's letter. Ayn asks about his test results, and a rattled Ferzin gets on his hands and knees and begs for forgiveness. Even though Ayn should have gotten a perfect score across all exams, he was forced to be placed in class E due to Nesh's orders. Ayn understands completely, though Ferzin offers some assistance, since being the lowest rank in class E brings with it its own set of problems. However, Ayn has already prepared to deal with these issues himself. A few days later, Ayn begins his new academy life with the most unexpressive face known to man. He runs into Lulu, who has also switched to her new uniform. After chatting for a while, Thomas shows up and asks the class to follow him to their new dorms. Ayn and Lulu are glad that Thomas is their new advisor. Thomas nervously glances at Ayn, hoping that he won't cause any trouble while he's in charge of the class. Lulu excitedly looks around the campus, which, as she expected, is filled with beautiful buildings. One of their classmates, Helena, points out in a matter-of-fact way that the campus is expected to be beautiful. While she acts high and mighty towards them, Lulu tells Ayn that Helena's house, Estrello, is a knighted family, meaning that they are only honorary nobles. In reality, she isn't that far off from a commoner. Helena, annoyed, is willing to forgive their transgression if Ayn agrees to be her personal manservant. Lulu is appalled, but Ayn is less so. He quickly agrees to be her servant, just because he wants to make as many friends as possible. Lulu asks him if he's sure about this, and he replies that he has plenty of experience being a servant. Helena proudly laughs in the most cliché and stereotyped manner possible, and Lulu asks Ayn how he could let himself be the servant of someone with such a stupid laugh. Thomas breaks up the chatter and tells them that they've arrived. Their new dorm is a rundown, dilapidated building that looks like a Left for Dead 2 stage. Lulu had heard rumors that lodgings differed between each class, but she never thought it'd be this bad. Helena marches up to Thomas and asks for an explanation, and he says that it is what it is. While other classes have private rooms, Class E only has one big room. Helena is mortified. Ecard, the instructor for Class D, points and laughs at Class E's dorm. Can joins in. While Thomas understands their grievances, he asks them to just drop off their belongings for now so he can explain more about their circumstances in class. Later in the lecture room, Helena re-airs her grievances regarding their living situation. Thomas tells her that the rules are the rules. Helena tries to find allies by protesting with her, but Ayn honestly finds the house acceptable. It has walls and a roof, and it is generally safe from monsters. Helena shudders to think about the living situations he's been in this whole time. Helena looks to Lulu, but even she is perfectly fine with sharing one big room with everyone since there are only five or so girls. Thomas reassures them all that they'll get their chance to switch dorm houses. The academy features a rank and point system that ranks their classes based on merit. Thomas explains that a class's rank depends on class points. These points are earned via lectures, attitudes, and written exams. These class points are then linked to their overall quality of life and after-school job opportunities. However, Ayn finds this strange. In the first place, those in class A have better abilities overall, while those in class E have worse abilities. It would be virtually impossible to climb the ranks. Thomas commends Ayn for catching on quickly. He snaps his fingers and shows them the current points for each class. Class E has a meager 137 points, while Class A has 243. Ayn astutely identifies these as the average scores on their exams. Thomas confirms his suspicions. While the point difference looks reasonable, the truth is Class E has never been able to bridge that gap. He identifies the problem in the class points system itself. Class ranks changed rarely in the past. In recent years, as the academy began to be more accommodating to the nobility, they created a new bottom line for them to unload their stress on. That's why Class E was created. Helena asks him if this means it is impossible for them to change class ranks, but Thomas thinks otherwise. He thinks that something interesting is going to happen. He explains that this year's Class D is filled with lower class nobles that couldn't be put into Class E this time. Class E has a special bomb put into the mix. Thomas encourages the class to fight tooth and nail to defeat Class D this year. Ayn notices that Thomas seems strangely gung-ho about their situation and he admits that he dislikes the situation in the academy. He apologizes for dragging them into school politics, but he sincerely hopes that they surpass Class D. Thomas brings out the class for a round of mock battles. The aim is to simply exchange blows, not knock the other guy out. That last part is directed at Ayn, for sure. Before Lulu and Ayn can partner up, Helena marches up to him and tries to snatch him away. Ayn says that he already has one, but Helena simply tells him to get rid of Lulu. 
Lulu mutters that there must be other partners for Helena, so Helena challenges her to a duel for the right to have Ain as a partner. Lulu realizes something Helena is only doing this because she was left out when the class split up into pairs. She hit the nail right on the head, even though Helena claims otherwise. Ain notices a student by himself and asks him if he'd be willing to partner up with Helena. The Sasuke wannabe says nothing. When Helena sees who Ain is calling out to, she tells him not to bother. The man is Jern of the Guilford House. His family's current head is said to be a crazy, barbaric individual who is rumored to have beaten another noble half to death. In short, the Guilford family has a poor reputation. Helena is convinced that Jern must be some sort of devil himself, though Aang doesn't seem to think so. Helena tries to say that Jern must have killed at least two people by now, not knowing that Jern is standing right behind her. He hears that Helena is quite confident with her swordsmanship, so he asks to play around with her a bit. Aang congratulates Helena for finding a training partner who looks like he could kill her with a flick of his finger. Helena is hysterical. She refuses to partner up with someone from the violent Guilford house. Jiren impatiently tells her to fight him already. Ain and Lulu proceed with their sparring match, but they take a break after a short while. He senses that Lulu seems a little distracted, and she explains that she's just really worried about Helena, who is currently fighting for her life. Jiren's blows are swift and heavy, and augmented by his mana circulation, they are damn near impossible to parry. Ain muses that this isn't even a match anymore, it's a massacre. Thomas advised the class to bring anyone injured to the infirmary, but at this rate, they might not have anything to carry back. Helena slips on her heel, leaving her wide open to one of Juren's strikes. Ain, sensing the danger, steps in and blocks Juren's blow. Helena hides behind Ain, who tells Juren that he is going too far. Juren shrugs, saying that accidents happen, and that's why they have nurses. Ain suggests that they just all get along, but Jiren would hate to get along with those from the lower class. Ain points out that he's in the same class as them now, but Jiren firmly believes that he's being treated unfairly. Ain warns him that isolating himself like this will cost him in the long run. More importantly, however, he wants him to apologize to Helena. Jiren refuses to bow his head to someone from a mere-mated family. But since he's bored, he'll give Ain a chance. He challenges him to a mock battle, and if Ain wins, He'll do whatever he wants. But if Jiren wins, he wants Ain to get on his knees and apologize. Jiren noticed that Ain seems to be a cut above the rest, but he is still confident that he can beat him. Ain, who was trying not to stand out, did something to stand out, and now he's confused about why he stood out. However, he knows that if he backs out now, it won't be pretty. He accepts Jiren's terms. Helena tugs at Ain's shirt and warns him that he might not come back alive, and he's glad that she's worried about him. That's not what she was trying to say at all. Even so, Ain tells them not to worry, he's just going to practice a little. Jiren looks forward to it. The two students take their places on the training grounds. After Jiren confirms that Ain is ready, he tosses him a real metal sword to make their battle feel more serious. Ain suggests that they set some ground rules for the duel first, but that only makes Jiren laugh. It makes it seem like Ain has a chance and Jiren is sure as hell he doesn't. Ain holds his ground as Jiren's sword clashes with his. Ain acknowledges that Jiren's strength is the real deal. He'd probably be the best sword fighter in the entire school. Too bad Ain exists. Jiren, seeing that his normal strength isn't doing anything, announces that he'll use physical enhancement magic. He creates some distance between them, which confuses Ain at first. Regardless of his reasons, this just means Ain can attack first. Ain swoops in with an attack form below, nearly blowing Jiren's arms off. Jiren drops to his knees, but he refuses to acknowledge defeat. His sword is still in his hand, and he's still conscious. Helena points out that his knee touched the canvas, but she cowers in fear when he looks her way. Jiren is frustrated with himself because he knows deep down that he can't see Ain's attack. Even so, he has his pride as a noble, and he refuses to lose to a nameless commoner. He cloaks himself with red, burning mana, the culmination of the Guilford family's magic, Rakshasa armor. Smoldering flames flicker around Jiren like a magnificent cape. He refuses to believe that someone like him could lose to someone like Ain. He begins his attack anew, and Ain notices that Jiren's speed is up a notch, while his flame cloak sword makes it difficult to judge distance or escape his attacks. Jiren reveals that he can only hold this form for a minute, so he challenges Ain to survive until the end. If he can, then it'll be his win, but if he runs, it'll be Jiren's. Ain has another idea. He starts exchanging blows with Jiren, and he goes on the offensive. Jiren is still sure of his victory, but he changes his mind when he sees Ain throwing a punch of all things. Ain's fist collides with the Rakshasa armor that Jiren is so proud of. 
Ayn then grabs his sword and smacks Jiren's face with the pommel. Ayn didn't do anything special. All he did was throw a punch. Jiren sits there with the realization that, just like his pride, his armor has been shattered by a commoner of class E. Jiren, prideful as he is, gracefully accepts his defeat. He apologizes to Ayn, though he tells him to direct his apologies to Helena. Helena still isn't sure if Jiren will actually say sorry, so she hides behind Ayn just in case. Jiren, as promised, gets on his knees and apologizes to Helena. Helena, surprised that Jiren so readily said sorry, isn't so bothered by it anymore. Ayn asks Jiren what he mentioned earlier about taking it out on Helena, and he says that it's a boring story. He explains that his instructor for the combat part of the exam was a friend of the noble his father beat up. Predictably, it ended pretty badly for Jiren. Though Jiren was confident in his own strength, he was sure that he wouldn't be able to learn anything in class e. He certainly didn't expect to be beaten by someone who wasn't even using any magic. Aware of the blatant favoritism in the academy, Jiren even considered getting himself expelled. Jiren now knows he was wrong. He lowers his head to the ground and begs Ayn to take him in as a disciple. During their battle, Jiren understood that Ayn was leagues above him. Ayn is hesitant to accept, since he can't teach other people as well as he'd like to believe. But Jiren is fine with just watching. He just wants to become stronger. Ayn accepts, on one condition. Jiren's face lights up, and he asks Ayn what that condition is. Ayn takes out his hand and asks Jiren to be his friend. Jiren blushes like a tomato and accepts. He doesn't mind that at all. Helena pokes fun at the fact that Jiren acted all embarrassed, and he claims that he was just surprised about it. Just like that, Ayn has made three friends and a disciple. Komi should start taking some notes. Thomas brings Classy to a dungeon for a group exercise. Ayn is surprised that the academy even has a dungeon under the academy. That sounds dangerous as hell. Helena makes fun of Ayn for not knowing something so simple, but Jiren has his bros back. Helena hides behind Lulu, but Ayn tells Jiren to calm down. He asks Helena to tell him more about the dungeon, and she obliges. The dungeon was first explored 500 years ago by adventurers, and it was considered the largest one in the world. The first things they discovered were magic stones, crystallized forms of the abyss. These crystals can be used for summoning monsters, decorations, or materials and fuel for magical pursuits. However, all the magic stones have since been mined, and the dungeon's only use now is as a venue for testing magic. The academy was built over the dungeon to prevent stray monsters from escaping and to serve as a training ground for knights. Ayn remarks that he always seems to learn something new when he's with Helena, which inflates her ego even more. Lulu argues with Helena, but Thomas finally speaks up and gets them to quiet down. He wants them all to, conveniently enough, form groups of four and to recover a fire element stone from the red slug that appears in the deepest portion of the fourth floor. While Helena is terrified of something so disgusting, Lulu is hit by a wave of nostalgia. She used to eat red slugs all the time. She tells them how the delicacy is cooked in her hometown, but it sounds less than appetizing for the two nobles in the group. Ayn misinterprets this as a symbol of deepening friendship. Thomas brings up the class points again and tells them that, at most, they could earn 80 points and close the gap considerably. Ecard laughs at what he perceives to be a wasted and desperate effort on the part of Class E that's right. Today, Class D and E will be having a joint exercise. Thomas warns everyone that violence is strictly forbidden during this exercise, and anyone who breaks this rule will be handed a heavy penalty. Jern asks for a moment of Ayn and Lulu's time, and he tells them that Ecard was his examiner during the swordsmanship test. He heard that the two of them gave Can a hard time, but he advises them to keep an eye out for Ecard more than Canned. Jiren puts his arm around Ayn, and they form a group with Lulu and Helena. Though Jiren has a lot to say to Helena, they form an alliance. Thomas, after seeing that everyone has formed teams, hands them all a map of the dungeon. However, Helena quickly notices that the map seems rather oversimplified. Thomas tells them that this is to prevent groups from either class trying to gain up on the others. Trading information is also forbidden. Though there are eight groups in total between both classes, there are only six slugs. Ayn recognizes that this means two groups could go without any slugs, or even more, if a group decides to overhunt them. Ecard sends his class into the dungeon without waiting for Thomas's signal. Thomas reminds him that they were supposed to start at the same time, and Ecard simply replies, skill issue. Thomas also noticed that Ecard didn't even brief his students on the map or the exercise, insinuating that Ecard must have leaked the details beforehand. Ecard denies such allegations and attacks Thomas' character instead for being placed in charge of Class E. Ayn approaches Thomas and apologizes for getting him stuck with Class E, but Thomas doesn't really care about stuff like that. 
He just finds it silly that some people here think being assigned to a higher class means their status is elevated as well. Thomas has wasted enough of their time, and he tells his class to get in the dungeon. As they run inside, Ikard cracks a smile. Ain's group enters the dungeon, which is filled with the fluttering lights of mana. While Lulu appreciates the sight, Helena is still ticked off by Class D. Lulu tells Helena to calm down and walk with caution, but Helena wants to go full throttle and take down the cheating Class D. Unfortunately, Jiren doesn't feel like it. While he hates Ecard and the students of Class D, he can't be bothered to give it his all. He finds it highly likely that Class D memorized the placements of the Red Slugs beforehand due to Ecard's meddling. Thus, trying to find one is a waste of time. Ain thinks otherwise. He thinks that if they try their hardest and find a red slug together, it'll make for a good memory. Jiren does a complete 180 and tells Helena to get her head in the game and crush Class D. Jiren leads the charge, though Lulu struggles to keep up. Thankfully, Helena sparks her competitive spirit by virtue of being an annoying rich girl. Ain places his hand on Lulu's back to try and keep her on pace. In the blink of an eye, they skip several meters forward, Right behind Jiren's back, Helena, reaching her limit, asks them to wait for her. Eventually, they encounter a small group of four goblins. Though they aren't powerful, Lulu suggests they find a way around to conserve their strength. Ignoring her, Jiren takes the two goblins on the right, and he lets Aang take the ones on the left. Together, they obliterate the goblins before they even have a chance to do anything in return. Goblin Slayer would be proud. Jiren is amazed that Aang cut them so cleanly, even through their bones. Ain's eyes narrow. He should have held back a bit. Lulu also praises Jiren for improving since his duel with Ain, and he credits Ain for training him. Helena, seeing the two boys in action, is confident of their chances of defeating Class D. Lulu notices something on the ground, which Ain identifies as a spell mark for summoning monsters. It's a trap set in place by a certain someone. Something skitters from the overgrowth, and all four of them can sense that something big is coming. A whole swarm of giant spiders, known as sires, start crawling out of the darkness. The whole group quickly falls into a panic as the sires surround them. Ain remembers Nesha telling him that a situation like this may happen, and to look forward to it as an important memory-making opportunity. Ain calmly draws his sword and is excited to make some memories. His friends, on the other hand, are not so much. A squire screeches in front of their faces. This exercise seems harder than Ain thought. Jiren volunteers to hold the line with Ain, and he tells Lulu and Helena to make a run for it. However, both girls resolve to make their stand with them, though Helena is less than enthusiastic about it. Ain's group ready themselves for a long battle. As their struggle begins, Ain shatters the monster attracting stone. With that out of the way, he can support his friends. Helena's sword is struck away from her hands, leaving her defenseless. Fortunately, Lulu fires a magic spell just in time to rescue her, but this time, Lulu is the one in danger. A sire pins Lulu to the ground, and it doesn't look good for their group. Helena rushes over to try and help her, but even Jiren is being slowly overpowered. Lulu closes her eyes in hopes that her death is as painless as possible, but she needn't worry. Ain is here to save the day. The sire is squashed to bits and pieces, and Ain swiftly comes to Jiren's aid. The surviving sires, seeing how quickly their kind are being killed, scurry away. Ain's group catch their breath, though Jiren is frustrated that he wasn't able to do anything like Ain can. It all dawns on them that if Ain wasn't there, they'd all be dead. They turn their attention to the black stone that called those monsters to begin with, and Jiren is quick to blame Akard, though he isn't 100% certain. Ain wants to investigate some more, but Lulu has lost all strength in her legs. It's not due to poison or fatigue, it's due to fear. Lulu beats herself up for being weak, but Ain tells her she showed remarkable courage by staying to fight with Helena. Helena also points out that Lulu saved her life. With Lulu's mental strength restored, they continue traversing the dungeon. Helena swears to be up whoever left that stone there. While running, Jiren notices that Ain has a pained look on his face. Ain explains that he's worried about their other classmates, who are also guaranteed to have run into similar traps. The dungeon could be a mess if it overflowed with such monsters. Fortunately, the magic stone can be traced back to its owner based on the money used to form it, so Jiren can later confirm if it really was Ikard who tried to kill them. However, as Lulu points out, it would be difficult to figure out where to place these traps to ensure that Class E students run into them. This means that there are collaborators. Helena's face lights up as they near their red slug. However, Ain gets a bad feeling, and he tells everyone to stop. A firebolt lands right by their feet as they face their opponents, Kand and his nameless bodyguard. Kand has been looking forward to exacting his revenge, 
but Ain and the others aren't impressed. The sires were more threatening. Kan pronounces them guilty for ruining his life, and he's going to make them pay. Lulu reminds him that violence has been strictly forbidden, and not even a noble like him could escape the consequences of his actions. Is Lulu hearing herself right now? Jiren isn't so worried, as he and Ain could easily take him on. Unfortunately for them, Kan has a whole group of people ready to fight for him. He guesses that they never could have seen this coming, but Lulu saw this coming. Kan calls their bluff, but even his bodyguard seems to take their side. Irritated, Kan orders everyone to attack Ain and his friends. They're confident that Ain is exhausted from fighting all those monsters, but confidence is all they have. Ain easily handles them one at a time, using nothing but karate chops, kicks, and his sword's pommel. Ain is struggling to incapacitate them without killing them. Kan is suddenly rethinking his course of action. Kan berates his men for losing against a commoner, prompting Ain to kick a sword that lands dangerously close to Kan's head. Kan's goons sense that something is wrong. For people who just fought several high-level monsters, they seem strangely unharmed. Kan finds this impossible, but Ain says that they did fight those sires, though several ran away. Kan thinks that they're just putting on a front, so he tries to rally his gang back together. Unfortunately, Jiren has already handled two of them, while Lulu and Helena more than hold their own in their respective fights. Ain gets a fluttering feeling in his stomach. This is teamwork. This is friendship. In no time at all, there's only one man left standing, Kan himself. Kan is outnumbered, outmatched, and outfriendshipped. Kan backs away and tries to appeal to their sense of honor, so Ain agrees to fight a one-on-one -on -one match. Kan shakily stands up and repeats his old move of using light step to stab Ain at high speed. Ain has already seen this trick once before, and defending against it is easy. Ain disarms Kan and tries to convince him that it's over. If there's one thing Kan is good at, it's running away, and he does just that. He swears that he'll have his revenge, one way or another. Hilariously enough, Ain catches up to Kan and lightly punches him. They round Kan and his Class D friends up with some rope. While Ain wants to continue looking for the Red Slug, they notice a pouch filled with the magic stones from the Red Slug. Their earlier suspicions were right on the money. Class D moved through the dungeon so quickly because they already knew the layout by heart. Ain gets a bright idea, and he asks them to hand over the stone.